Hello everyone, I welcome you to CEC lecture series. I am Nupur Chavla, teaching English literature at Maitri College, Delhi University. Today's lecture is part of the ongoing series on English drama and it is titled John Osborne, Look Back in Anger. Now, when we hear the name John Osborne, I am sure we would have come across uh, you know, his mention uh, whenever we looked up about uh, English drama or uh, you know, theatre in Britain. Um, so, just to tell you a little bit more, uh, John uh, James Osborne is his uh, full name and he was born in 1929 and was around until uh, 1994 and he was an English playwright, an actor and also a screenwriter. So, he is a 20th century um, figure who was uh, around uh, you know until uh, later in the day. Um, he actually began writing his plays in uh, 1950s. So, uh, second half of the 20th century is uh, where we situate his uh, plays that he uh, wrote for the stage. Um, one of his earliest plays uh, was The Devil Inside Him, which was written in 1950. Uh, then in 1958, we had um, the play Personal Enemy. Uh, 1959 saw so staging of the world of Paul Slickly. And uh, in 1960, we had a subject of scandal and concern as yet another play by Osborne. And of course, the list is endless. You know, uh, when we notice that uh, the number of plays written by Osborne, we understand that how prolific as a playwright he was. Uh, starting from the 50s, uh, going on up to 90, up to um, uh, 70s and even later, he uh, wrote a lot many plays. Uh, now, if we look at, uh, you know, what is it that he wrote about, if we are to talk about that, he was, Osborne was actually known for his uh, political stance, right? Uh, most of his plays um, engaged with the social and political norms of the day and uh, they cast a critical glance at those issues that, uh, you know, uh, what those norms are doing to people uh, how are they impacting people's everyday life? How are they impacting their imagination, their mood, their temperament and all of that? So, we can say that, uh, you know, Osborne's plays in that sense were uh, political and also very socially conscious. Now, when I say political, it means that, uh, you know, a lot of times this, uh, this word is uh, used widely but then seldom discussed. So, politics doesn't just mean, you know, being involved with, um, you know, this party or that, but politics uh, in a more conceptual way um, or in a more conceptual sense also means taking a stand, right? Uh, which side of the fence are you on a particular issue? Uh, when the moment you take a stand on an idea, on an issue, on a conundrum, then automatically you or become a political um, or your engagement becomes a political one, right? So that's what John Osborne knew which side of the society he was on. And that's why, you know, a lot of his works are, um, uh, you know, uh, referred to as belonging to social realism. We'll, of course, talk about that uh, in a while. But uh, just to show you on screen that that is what John Osborne looked like. And he was born uh, in 1929 and was uh, around uh, um, 1994. Um, now, the play in discussion uh, today is uh, Look Back in Anger. And it was written in 1956. And it's a realist play, right? So, when I say it's a realist play, it's basically to, uh, you know, uh, demarcate it or basically um, uh, to, you know, kind of uh, distinguish it from the uh, 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 plays which were written uh, just before uh, the 1950s where, uh, you know, uh, such, I mean, those works would somewhat escape reality. I mean, that is what is said that one notes uh, some kind of an escapism um, in those plays um, and they were called as the well-made plays, right? Um, but as against that, uh, we have uh, this play which is a realist play which means that it will look at reality in all its complexities and it will confront reality in all honesty, right? 
and uh, we see that 1956 is uh, and 1950 is when he wrote his first play. So 1956, a fairly recent, uh, you know, uh, 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 in uh, you know, in accordance with uh, when John Osborne started to write. So it's a fairly early play uh, in that sense, but it is one of those that uh, acquired huge success uh, all across, right? Now, uh, this play is actually about the life and marital struggles of an intelligent and educated but disaffected young man of the working class that is Jimmy Porter and his equally competent yet impassive upper middle class wife Alison. So, uh, in this little description uh, when I have told you what the play is about, two, three things become important. First is that um, uh, your central hero Jimmy Porter is educated and intelligent. Second, he is a young man. Third, he belongs to a particular class which is what? The working class. Likewise, his wife is um, also competent uh, uh, and, and belongs to the upper middle class, right? So, um, the fact that he is educated and yet he is disaffected. Disaffected meaning that he has some, um, some reservations, he has some issues with um, how things are, um, you know, panning out around him. And of course, he's also young and he belongs to the working class, but his wife is from the upper middle class. So, right at the outset, we notice the way this couple um, is, you know, characterized. We understand, uh, you know, any um, reader of uh, uh, who's, who, who reads carefully would see that the playwright has set us up for some kind of a class um, uh, struggle, if you can call it that, or he, he sets us up for some kind of an interaction between two classes. Now, what is the, what are the terms of this interaction? How do the two, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, talk? Uh, is it a cordial kind of an equation? Is it, uh, is it a, a one which is bitter, etc.? That's something that we will notice a little later. But two things become very important that your uh, protagonist is young, is educated and is belonging to a particular class, right? So, these three parameters actually become quite important for us uh, to understand and appreciate exactly what the play is about, right? So, what we see then is I would, I would like all of you to uh, note that how, um, you know, the details about the characters, their background, their personalities. Uh, really tells us a lot about what the playwright is wanting to do, what the playwright is wanting to say, right? So, that's where or that's how we glean information uh, for, uh, for a better analysis of the play, right? Um, now, if you uh, notice that I'm sure that you, a lot of you would have come across the phrase angry young men or angry young man. Now, that's a phrase which, of course, is also, uh, you know, used in the context of um, uh, Indian uh, uh, cinema as well, uh, you know, where um, a particular uh, uh, actor was, uh, uh, was popularized or, or was actually popularly known with this epithet. But you see, the, the origin of this uh, epithet also um, lies around the same time uh, in John Osborne and this other writer called as the uh, called as Kingsley uh, uh, Amis uh, uh, Amis Kingsley, right? So uh, now this play particularly popularized this term "angry young men" to describe um, Osborne and his generation who employed the harshness of realism in the theatre in contrast to the escapist theatre that characterized the previous generation. As I was just now saying that. Um, the phrase uh, got valence uh, through this play because uh, uh, you know uh, this uh, this play was of a particular kind. It was realist in nature, which means that it would uh, you know kind of confront the reality head on uh, instead of uh, whitewashing it or instead of looking away from the uh, concerns that really impact people at a given point of time. So this kind of a looking away approach was. Um, the characteristic of the plays, as uh, uh, just now told you, it was characteristic of the previous generation. But this one, with its sharp realism, uh, stands out. And uh, from such a, a style, 
uh, you know, emerges the figure of the angry young man. Of course, we are going to talk about it still at length uh, in just a bit about this uh, epithet. But uh, just to show you on your screen, this is a scene from the play's performance on stage. Uh, what we notice is, uh, you know, there is a room uh, which has an ironing table. It also has sofas. It also further, uh, you know, behind has uh, further other furnitures. So, what we see is that it is, um, uh, it is a play which is set in one room alone, right. Uh, that is the only setting uh, which Osborne has and uh, this room kind of doubles up as a living room, as a bedroom, as a dining room, etc. all at, this, at uh, uh, in, in, in one go. And secondly, uh, the ironing table, the woman, uh, the man reading newspaper, etc. If you notice these details, this also goes on to tell you that how it's a it's a play which deals with domestic life, right? And that is another very important aspect of John Osborne's look back in anger. Now, what exactly is the relevance of uh, domestic life? You see, um, this brings us to our next point that uh, you know uh, this play, look back in anger is um, known to belong to uh, this movement called the kitchen sink realism, right. Now, what is kitchen sink realism? It is nothing but a, a British cultural movement which developed in the late 1950s and early 1960s, right. Now, in this, you know, uh, the, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the works belonging to this movement had protagonists that were defined by the word angry young men right, as I just now discussed with you. So, in this uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, in the works belong, uh, belonging to this movement, uh, the protagonists were angry young men and uh, who were disillusioned by the modern society. They were not happy with a lot of things uh, of modern society, right. Uh, the second thing that we need to know is that, uh, 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 you know, in uh, plays or in works belonging to the kitchen sink realism, um, such plays depicted the domestic space or situations of the working class Britons and explored socio political issues, exactly as is the case in John Osborne as well. It is a domestic space, right? I drew your attention to it even uh, from the stage setting that we noted in the picture, just uh, uh, we had just uh, uh, you know looked at. So, it is a domestic space or situations. Uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, such plays work with a particular or, or they depict a particular class of uh, people that is the working class and uh, through such a scenario, they explored the social political issues, right. Uh, so, uh, mirroring this aspect of kitchen sink realism is Osborne's play which is set in a one room attic apartment which serves as a bedroom, a kitchen, a living room and also a dining room, right. So, we see that how this play seems to be uh, subscribing to uh, a lot of uh, the, uh, uh, the parameters of kitchen sink realism. A fourth parameter of uh, this cultural movement is that um, works belonging to this movement, they have harsh, realistic, direct style as against the escapism of the well-made plays of previous generation, right. So, these are direct, they are harsh, they are realistic, right uh, and hence the term realism as well. Um, now, if you are to look at, uh, you know, who coined this term, the term kitchen sink school was first used by the art critic David Sylvester in 1954 to describe a group of painters who depicted social realist type of scenes of domestic life in their paintings, right. So, uh, they used to paint a certain kind of paintings which, uh, which uh, showcase domestic scenes and uh, they were realist uh, and, uh, you know, very true to life. So, um, uh, so uh, you know, David Sylvester, an art critic, used this term to refer to the works of those painters, but then of course, it was, uh, you know, uh, adopted in the literary sphere as well, okay. Now, having looked at these ideas about the kitchen sink uh, uh, realism, about angry young men, about the idea of, uh, you know, how John Osborne was a particular kind of a playwright, 
uh, it's also important for us to uh, understand uh, the times uh, you know when John Osborne was actually writing this play right um, as said before uh, it was written in 1954 so which of course tells us that it's a post war play post war post uh, world war right so 1935 uh, 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 um, to uh, 1949 is when the Second World War was, right, if I uh, got those years correct. Um, so after the Second World War, the world was, of course, shaken up in uh, very many ways. There was wide widespread destruction. The value systems were called to question, um, uh, you know, uh, the structures which were uh, in place before they were shaken up, um, not just, uh, you know, material uh, um, uh, change, but there was also a lot of um, ideological um, and, um, uh, you know, um, um, value system uh, or, a, or a change in value system also that was witnessed uh, around this time. So, uh, this play then uh, actually depicts the post-war British society. So, as the play depicts uh, post-war British society in 1940s, such a society at that time was rallying for change, right? Uh, change why? Because the harsh conditions of war had generated a sense of shared struggle and destiny amongst people, right? Uh, of course, everybody was together in war, uh, facing the same consequences, right? So, uh, that, um, uh, you know, a mass, uh, um, uh, you know, event gave people a sense of shared struggle and destiny. That all of them were struggling with the similar conditions and they were destined to head in a similar direction, right? So, this uh, a sense of shared struggle and destiny then led to some kind of a commonality of feeling as well, a commonality of sentiment as well. So, now what was that commonality of sentiment? That they wanted to or they thought of, uh, you know, kind of uh, redoing the society, reconstructing it and restructuring it on democratic principles, right? That was one of the beliefs that the society needs to be uh, remade um, along different set of principles, right? So, if the war had, uh, you know, uh, brought widespread destruction, um, the rich became poor, uh, the poor, of course, uh, suffered immensely. Uh, now, when such was the situation, people wanted to rebuild the society along a certain lines. And what was that? They wanted to restructure it or reconstruct it along democratic principles. Democratic principles meaning that they were looking forward to a society which would have opportunities for all. There would be no biases amongst different social sections, um, there would be egalitarianism or the society would be egalitarian, everyone would have a chance to better themselves, everybody would have an opportunity for social mobility, everyone would be able to construct a life of their choice which was comfortable and rewarding, right? So, that is what we mean by uh, visualizing a society uh, you know, uh, constructed along democratic principles, right? So, in fact, when we look at this aim of the post-war British society, one also see that such a view had the foundations of a welfare state, right? When people were propelled by this aim, um, we notice, uh, you know, um, uh, a semblance of what we call as a welfare state. So, welfare state meaning that where the state is responsible for the well-being of its citizens, a uh, state makes sure that everyone gets their due and everybody is leading a life which is comfortable and uh, fulfilling, right? So, these were the ideals that uh, they were looking forward to and it looked like, uh, you know, that uh, Britain was heading towards the establishment of a welfare state. And in fact, the Labour Party in 1954, I think, it uh, also won the elections um, just on this basis that how they also, uh, you know, wanted 
to uh, uh, build the society along democratic lines right so we have seen uh, of course now this is this is just one aspect of the context we will uh, continue the discussion of the uh, context uh, in the next part of the lecture as well but to um, uh, you know summarize the points that we made in this uh, lecture first thing is we discussed that how john osborne is an english actor screenwriter playwright who was uh, around uh, until 1994 so he was a 20th century playwright uh, next we said that how his works uh, you know are particularly political they engage with the social political issues and they clearly take a stand uh, third we discussed that how uh, you know uh, um, his works are also often associated with uh, uh, with this genre that is of uh, kitchen sink realism and secondly his plays also give rise to uh, what we call as uh, uh, you know this uh, particular character that is the angry young man so uh, kitchen sink realism again a cultural movement uh, in the british context um, which focused on the domestic which focused on the issues uh, uh, you know in a domestic setup um, it was uh, it it uh, you know kind of confronted issues uh, head on instead of um, whitewashing them uh in such uh, you know uh, uh works a particular kind of a, of a protagonist emerges that is the angry young man which is a quintessential uh, uh, protagonist of uh, the 50s and the 60s who would question the wrongs of society who would uh, cast a critical uh, look at uh, different social mores different social practices etc and uh, that's where the uh that uh, you know uh, uh, typical character emerges and uh, from there we move on uh, we discussed that what were the conditions in britain at that time which led to this kind of uh, uh, or you know uh, such cultural movement to flourish which is the kitchen sink movement and also the angry young men and what we understood was that it was a post war british society which uh, was together you know a uh, kind of facing the um, uh, harsh conditions uh, that were left behind after the war and uh, which gave them a sense of shared struggle and destiny and with that from there emerged this aim of reconstructing society along democratic principles and therefore were the uh, from there were seen um, you know um, was seen a semblance of the welfare state so this kind of a dis uh, disaffection with the uh, conditions around then becomes the reason for uh, realism for uh, why uh, such a protagonist came into being that was called as the angry young man because art became that means to express the sentiment of disapproval disaffection etc right so having uh, discussed this in the next part of the lecture we will uh, discuss the context a, a bit more and then go on to discussing the crucial uh, themes that the play engages with thank you